Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. In this video, we're going to look at section 1.7, which deals with application problems, which are otherwise known as story problems, which may strike fear into the hearts of many, but you're not alone. A lot of us do struggle with story problems. It essentially takes a lot of practice, and we can uh, employ some, some strategies that we're going to take a look at in this video as we do some examples. The first strategy is the most simple as possible. We want to keep it simple. When it comes to any story problem, we need to read it. And we need to read it many times to make sure that we understand it. But each time we read it, we want to approach it with a different strategy. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first time we read any story problem, we need to know the words. We have to make sure we understand the terminology being used. As an example, if the story problem says, in an isosceles triangle. Well, if I don't know what an isosceles triangle is or what those terms mean, I can't go any further in this story problem. So you have to make sure you understand the words being used. So that's your first strategy when you read the story problem. The second time you read it, you ask yourself, what is the given information? What's useful that I can pull from this explanation? Then we read it a third time and we ask ourselves, what do I need to find? What is this problem giving me as my variable? What am I going to assign an x to or, a, or any other uh, variable I use to denote what I need to find? Once we've done that, we've read it three times, now it's time to attempt to build the equation and solve it. And honestly, this is probably the hardest part, to build a workable equation. Solving it's relatively simple. At this point in algebra, our algebra skills are pretty uh, defined, I guess you could say. Once we find a solution, we need to read the problem a fourth time to say, does the solution I found make sense? Does it have the appropriate units? It, does it answer the actual question that was asked? So let's go ahead and uh, do an example here. This one deals with simple interest. And hopefully when we see the term simple interest, it conjures up this equation in our mind. This may not always be given. So you have to know this equation. Interest equals principal times rate times time. That's what it translates to. Interest is the amount of money earned on some principal P at some interest rate R, which is usually given as a percent. And hopefully we know oh, percents have to be converted to numbers. And T is the time that it's earning that interest, generally given in years. So let's read the problem. And the first time we're going to read it is just make sure we understand the terminology. A sum of money is invested, and I'm underlining that because we have to know what that term is, at 10%. And twice that amount at 12%. So what I know from this, just from reading it, is we're going to invest some money at 10%, and we're going to do twice that same amount at 12%. The yearly income was 2,890. So I know the income is going to be what I get after some amount of time that it's invested at 10% and invested at 12%. I'm going to get a total amount of interest here. And because this says yearly, that's given information. Well, and we'll get to that when we read it. I know what a year is, OK? So I know that's a unit of time. So and then how much was invested at each rate? So that's the first time we read it. I'm just making sure I understand invested twice yearly, understand what the terms are. Now I'm going to read it a second time and say, what is given information? A sum of money is invested at 10%. So I have something being invested at 10%. Twice that amount at 12%. So 12% is given information. The yearly income was 2,890. I'm going to use a table in this example and in some of the other examples to come. And I'm just going to put in the given information. I already have 10% here for one account, 12% for another account. Uh, I'm, I know my interest rate, 0.1 convert percents to numbers, or 0.12, so that's the rate. And I know the time because it says yearly. That's given information, one year that they're in there. Now we have a total amount of interest. The interest total in this column is 2000 890. 
So now I have to assess my table and say, well, what's the missing information? I need P, R, T, and I. Well, I have some R, and I have some T, and I have some I. What I'm missing is P. So I have to go back and read it the third time to say, what do I need to find? A sum of money is invested at 10%, and twice that amount is invested at 12%. Well, that sum of money is my principal. So I'm going to say some amount of money is invested at 10%. Twice that sum is invested at 12%. So now my table is complete. I can start building my equation. Principal times rate times time is interest. So P times 0.1 times 1 is 0.1P. In my 12% account, I have 2P times 0.12 times 1 is my interest. So 0.24P is my interest. And the total is 28.90. Well, how do we find a total? Well, the total, we have to do addition, sum. We have to add. So I'm going to go over here, 0.1P plus 0.24P equals 28.90. So we find that essentially just by saying this interest and this interest is the yearly interest, the interest gained in an entire year. And now this is my equation. Now the easy part, solving it. When I solve it, I just combine like terms, 0.34p equals 28.90. And then I can divide by 0.34, 28.90 over 0 0.34 is 8,000. Let's clean that up a little bit so that hopefully you can see it in the video there. 8,000. Well, we have an answer now. P is 8,000. 8,000 what? We need to assign units. Units are very important in story problems. Well, we're dealing with a sum of money, so I know this 8,000 is money. But what is this value? It, this is the money that's invested at 10%. So I'm just going to write 10%. So we found this. Did we answer the question? Well, let's go back and read that fourth and final time. A sum of money is invested at 10% and twice that amount at 12%. The yearly income was 2890 How much was invested at each rate? I only found one of these values, the one at 10%. I need to find each rate. So we look at this and say, well, this is just twice P. If P is this value, uh, actually, I think I did a little math there. It's 8,500. Obviously, I worked this out. This is not something I would do in my head. At 12%. So now we've answered the entire question. All right, we found that there's $8,500 at invested at 10%, $17,000 at 12%. Now, does this answer make sense? Well, 10% of this plus 12% of that, $2,890, well, that makes sense, right? It's, it's a value less than either of these. That just means the interest rate was relatively small, 10% and 12%. And I say relatively small because it would be great in today's economy if we could get those kind of interest rates. All right, so our answer makes sense. We're going to move on to another application problem. And this one deals with mixtures. A coffee company wants a new flavor of cappuccino. How many pounds of coffee beans worth $7 a pound should be added to 14 pounds of beans worth $4 a pound to get a mixture worth $5 a pound? So the first time I read it is just to understand the words. OK, I understand what pounds are. And, and I understand that there's two types of beans being mixed together, and they have different values. So I have bean number one and bean number two. So again, I'm going to use a table. And I know something about value. If I know I have some cost, and I know that cost per item, if I know the number of items, I will have the total cost. Well, value per pound times pounds equals the total value of whatever bean I'm working with. So we do a little bit of assessing. Do I understand? Do I bring enough information to the story problem that I can complete it? So now I'm going to read it a second time and look for that given information. 
we're told that some coffee bean is worth $7 a pound. Okay, well, bean one is $7 a pound. It's value for every pound. And it's going to be added to 14 pounds of a bean, which is our second bean. I'm told something about pounds. Well, I know the number of pounds there. And that's worth $4 a pound. Hey, this bean, number two, is worth $4 a pound. To get a mixture worth $5 a pound, well, that's given information. The mixture's value per pound is $5, $5 a pound, or $5 per pound. So it, to complete our table, we have this column, we have this column, and I know how to find a total. It has to do with something that's just adding, right? That's what total means, to do a sum. I'm missing some pieces to my table. Well, bean number one, how many pounds? Well, let's read it the third time and say, all right, we have how many pounds of coffee beans were $7? $7, how many pounds? That's where I'm going to assign my variable. Should be added to 14 pounds of the beans. Well, here's a key word that I should have underlined before. So many pounds of this are being added to 14 pounds of this bean. Well, if we're going to do that, this is 14 plus x, or x plus 14. The order really doesn't matter. So now we have our table complete. Well, let's find what bean number one's total value is. The cost times the amount is the total value. The cost times the amount is the total value. And here it's going to be 56. It's just 4 times 14. Here we have 5 times 14 plus x. And I'm just going to distribute. And I'm going to get 5 times x and 5 times 14, which is 70. Now, to find the value of the mixture, well, I have a value for my uh, $7 beans, and I have a value for my $4 beans. If I put them together, I'm going to have a value for my mixture. Essentially, this value plus this value equals this value. This is my equation. And I'm just going to write it up here, 7x plus 56 equals 5x plus 70. And now we can solve this equation. If I subtract 5x from both sides, I can subtract 56 from both sides, and I'm going to get 2x equals 14. And so now I can solve that, x equals 7. 7 what? Again, we need our units. Well, this was my column for pounds. x represented the number of pounds of the $7 bean. So 7 pounds of $7 beans. So we could say of $7 beans. Is that what it asked me to find? I found an answer. Let's go back and read the story problem a fourth time. How many pounds of coffee beans worth $7 a pound should be added? And we could continue. But at this point, we realized, oh, we were looking for the number of pounds of the $7 bean, which I found right here. And I'm sorry about crowding that, but the amount of board space I have is relatively limited here. So $7 a pound, we did answer the question. Does it make sense? Well, let's kind of review here for a moment. This is an expensive coffee, and this is a relatively inexpensive coffee. And if we're mixing them together, well, the cost should lie somewhere between $7 and $4. Makes sense that it's $5 a pound. Well, we should look at our weight as well. The sum of this weight plus the sum of that weight shouldn't be any crazy weight. You know, if I got something like 50 pounds, well, that would be kind of ridiculous. But I see seven pounds, so I'm using half of the amount of this for that coffee. And it, this price is closer to this value than that, so it makes sense that this would be a greater value than this one. So just doing a little critical thinking, and we can say, you know what? That is a reasonable answer. All right, let's move on to the next example here. This one's uniform motion. And I uh, wrote our equations that we need to bring to the table when it comes to uniform motion, just like I did with the interest. Interest equals principal times rate times time. Well, this is distance equals rate times time. Now, this equation, uh, if you think about it, we work with it all the time, daily. If you drive to school or work or wherever you drive to, if you do drive, 
You see this equation every time you read your speedometer. Your speedometer is measured in miles per hour. That is a variation of this. Rate equals miles, which is a distance, per hour, which is a unit of time. Essentially, if I solve this for r, I divide both sides by d. So we actually look at this be, uh, equation every single day if we drive. There's other things we can do. We can say time equals distance over rate, another variation of that equation. And sometimes maybe other variables are involved. Uh, displacement, which is sometimes labeled as s, equals v, which is our velocity, times time, which is t. Notice time is pretty consistent no matter where you go. And we can write any variation of that equation. It's just rearranging it algebraically. So let's look at this uh, example of an application problem here. It says, a boat heads upstream on a river with a current of three miles per hour, which takes five hours. The return trip takes two and a half hours. What is the speed of the boat? So I've read it the first time, and I feel comfortable. I understand the words, but I just want to highlight for a moment upstream. Well, to go upstream, we know that water flows downhill, right? Water doesn't flow uphill. We don't have rivers that go up. So it flows down. So we're, if we're going upstream, we're going against the flow of the river. And that's an important concept. All right. It has a current of three miles per hour, which takes five hours. The return trip. This is another key. Well, if we're coming back, we're going with the current. And it makes sense that the trip takes a little shorter because we're going with the current. We're not fighting the current. What is the speed of the boat? All right. The second time we read it, we're going to say, what's the given information? Well, if we're going upstream, we're, we're going to assume that the boat is, has a constant speed, but it's going upstream, which is against the current three miles an hour. So I know I'm fighting the current. If I'm going upstream, it's against the current. And if I'm coming downstream, the return trip, I'm with the current. All right. And we're given something about time. We know five hours upstream and 2.5 hours downstream. But what do we know about the distance? Well, here's a, a good place where not just using a table, but maybe we want to do an illustration. I'm going from some point on the river to some other point on the river. And that's, you know, in the most basic sense, I'm no artist, so we're just going to do this. I'm traveling from here against the current, and then I'm traveling from here back to where I started. It's a round trip, right? I head upstream, and then I come back downstream. I return to where I started. That's the key word, and that's why I underlined it. So the distance here is the same. The distance upstream equals the distance downstream. So I'm just going to say those two are equal, whatever they may be. So what am I missing here? Well, either distance or rate. And I was told something about rate, miles per hour. Rate equals distance over time. So, uh, and if, when I read it the third time, it asks me, what is the speed of the boat? So I'm going to call that my variable r, because I'm looking for a rate, or maybe I want to use velocity, whatever your choice. So the rate of the boat is r, but it's going against the current upstream. So whatever the boat is, minus 3, because I'm fighting that current. It's slowing me down. If I go downstream, I'm traveling with the current. So it's going to make the boat go a little bit faster. So the rate of the boat plus the speed of the current, pushing it along. And now, what we have is rate times distance equals time. Well, if their distances are the same, their rate times their times are the same. So I can build my equation. So I have this times that. 5 times r minus 3 is equal, my distance, and let me just write it in here. We've completed our table. We can build that equation. This equals 2.5 times r plus 3. And if we do the distributive property and uh, combine some like terms, we're going to get uh, 2.5 r. 
and I know I'm skipping steps here, but you can work this out uh, at home. Uh, let's see, we're going to have 15 and says 22.5, and we can divide both sides by 2.5, and we're going to get the rate of the boat, which is 9. 22.5 divided by 2.5 is 9. 9 what? Well, we have to look at what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a distance that's in hours, because this was 5 hours and 2.5 hours, and a rate, which was miles per hour. So our unit is 9 miles per hour, distance over rate or over time. So we have rate is 9 miles per hour. Let's make sure that we've answered the question, because we do have a solution here. So we could read through it a fourth time, but the key is right here. What is the speed of the boat? R was my variable that represented the speed of the boat. R is 9 miles per hour. That is the speed of the boat. And that answer makes sense. Here we're going uh, three times the speed of the current. So at least we're going to get somewhere, right? It has to be greater than that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be going anywhere. So it's a, it's a reasonable answer. And if we think about it, yep. 9 miles per hour there, it's going to take some time because we're really only going 6 miles an hour. And on the way back, we're going that much faster. We're coming back at 12 miles an hour. Well, 6 miles an hour, 12 miles an hour, you think about it, if this is half the rate, this should be twice the time. And we can see it is. So it does make sense. It is a reasonable answer. All right, let's move on to the last example. And this one is going to be your quiz, essentially. It says, Pat, by himself, can paint four rooms in 10 hours. If his partner Bob helps, they can do the same job together in six hours. If Bob works alone, how long would it take him to paint the four rooms? Before I let you loose on your own to solve this, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background about how to deal with constant rate equations. Constant rate equations basically say one item or one job, we'll call it a job here, is completed in some amount of time, some unit of time. So one job for, for so many units of time. So if you read this, we can say Pat can paint four rooms in 10 hours. If we think about it, Four rooms is the job, so we could just say, you know, that we could say this is four rooms. And he does that in some unit of time, 10 hours. All right, four rooms per 10 hours. If his partner Bob helps, they can do the same job together in six hours. If Bob works alone, how long would it take him to paint the four rooms? So we've read the problem. We're, we're pulling that given information. Well, what do we know about together? What does that tell us? It tells us to add. So I know I'm going to add Pat's uh, constant rate and Bob's constant rate. Well, that's my missing piece. That's what I'm going to read the second time and say, here I need to sign, assign some variable. He can do four rooms in X amount of hours. Well, in here, it says they could do the same room together. So together, that's another thing that I'm pulling from here the second time that I read it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of heads up on this. So Bob, his rate, he gets the four rooms done in an unknown amount of hours. And the time together, if I put them together, the four rooms get done in six hours. Now, because of this word right here, that's what we can do to build the equation together. Patrick and Bob equal together, because they're working together. Patrick plus Bob is the time it takes together. Now, one thing to simplify this equation before you actually put it together is to realize that the four rooms is the one job. Because in every step that we read this, Pat's doing four rooms. That's his one job. Pat or Bob's going to help do that one job of painting four rooms. And it asks, how long would it take Bob to paint the room 
or the four rooms by himself. How long does it take him to do that one job? So really we don't need four rooms, we can substitute it with one job. This will get done in 10 hours, this will get done in X amount of hours, if they work together, that one job gets done in six hours. So build your equation, solve it, make sure your answer makes sense. Go back to the problem, read it the fourth time, and say, does this work the way it should? Does this make sense that Bob's time is this long? Okay, is it a reasonable answer? This has been section 1.7, applications. Thank you for watching.